thank you for having me. And it's lovely to see so many old friends on this call. It's a real old get together. Um, and um, hopefully not too far in the future, we'll be able to meet for real rather than virtually. But it's good to be able to take advantage of these technologies to, to keep in contact. So I'll say a few words about the conference, its ambitions, how it's being organized and how you could contribute to it perhaps. What is envisaged is something of uh, an extraordinary scale. It will be the biggest ever effort of the European Union to engage with citizens outside of elections, of course, um, with a, a number of levels for this engagement. Firstly, anybody um, is invited to organize a conference event. That is a meeting, a town hall meeting, or a chat in your living room with some friends. Um, to discuss the future of Europe, its priorities, where you think the EU should go. Um, many governments are organising town hall events. I was talking the other day with the Estonian and the Slovakian minister, ministers for European affairs in their countries. The governments are ready to organise town hall meetings across the country. Um, the Estonians are doing... Um, joint meetings with the Finns because they speak an almost well, a similar language as well for that citizens can join in uh, digitally. Um, the Slovaks have committees of experts on every subject as well to feed in. Um, it really is an open process. And all that material, all any meeting that has taken place and drawn up some conclusions or some recommendations can place it on a, a multilingual digital platform that the Commission has, is organising uh, with, with assistance. And that will be a venue, a digital venue, to engage and debate as well. You can comment on other people's suggestions. And it, it, it really is going to be a gigantic thing. And you might think, my goodness, that's a, going to be cacophony. Um, and it, indeed, that is a risk. But the idea is that the contributions will be analysed, um, classified with and, and quantified with the help of artificial intelligence, so you see what themes are trending, what, what major concerns there are. But then humans, not just computers, will work on it to try and distill ideas coming out of that huge, huge platform. The next phase in that uh, um, is citizens' panels. At European level, um, randomly selected citizens um, through an opinion polling company, Kantar, of uh, maybe 150 to 200 people each will meet to look at that material that's coming out and to discuss their own ideas as well. Um, they will be organised by theme. I'll come back to the themes. Um, but that, those, they, they don't preclude new themes coming up, depending on what people are saying, of course, and what citizens are feeding into this mechanism. Um, those citizens' panels will deliberate and also make their own recommendations. And they are people who are not politicians. They're not coming from NGOs. They're not coming from, organ from trade unions, employers, organisations, or anything. They are randomly selected citizens. Um, I see there are some Irish uh, participants in this call, and um, I think people are looking to uh, the experience of Ireland a little bit. It's not quite the same, of course, um, in recent years in that field. And then finally, there's the conference plenary, which will be composed of an equal number of representatives of national parliaments and of the European Parliament, um, all the governments, of course, three commissioners, um, and representatives from via the Committee of Regions of regional and local government, um, the uh, social partners, um, the Economic and Social Committee, and, and possibly others still being discussed at the moment. That plenary um, will be the, the, the big showpiece of it, as it were, but is also supposed to, in principle, distill a certain number of recommendations and conclusions. So it's it's a huge, a huge exercise. Um, 
that is taking place. And it's at the same time a huge opportunity for debating the future of Europe. It's also a huge risk. Uh, there are a number of risks. One is that, um, that there isn't much consensus on anything. <laughs> Another is that there is consensus on a very large number of things, too many as it were to manage. But perhaps the biggest risk of all is that it does distill a number of concrete, precise recommendations, but then these are not followed up afterwards, creating a huge sense of disappointment. And there are a number of levels at which that disappointment might set in. Firstly, within the conference structure itself, because all this is being managed by an executive board composed of three representatives each of the Parliament, the Commission and the Council, plus observers, observers from the other group in Parliament, observers from um, uh, the national parliaments, the COSAC trio, observers from uh, uh, to the social partners and the Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of Regions. So again, quite big, but as full voting members, three each. For the Commission, that's three commissioners, uh, uh, led by Commissioner Suitha. For the Parliament, it's Giefe Hofstadt, who leads the delegation, and the other two are the leaders of the two largest groups, the EPP and the Socialist Group. And for the Council, it's the current president in office, the Portuguese Minister Zacharias, um, uh, Maria, Maria Zacharias, followed by the two next ministers in the Council's rotation of presidencies. So as you can see, those are all quite busy people that have jobs elsewhere, but they are supposed to manage this conference. Um, actually, probably the one who's able to devote most time for it is Guy Verhofstadt, because he now lo no longer leads his group in the European Parliament. Um, and so he, he is able to take quite a, a prominent role to the extent I venture to say that um, some of the others are perhaps a little bit wary of him. But um, that, is the steering group, and it is also supposed to reach its decisions by consensus. So, as we know that some in the some member states within the council don't want this conference to reach uh, far-reaching conclusions, certainly don't want at this stage are saying that they don't want treaty change, for instance. Uh, there's already a risk that it gets. Uh, blocked or reduced to a, a lower level of ambition at that stage. Underneath the, the um, executive board, by the way, is a common secretariat with um, six officials from each institution, um, which is, is not that really the organizing secretariat because the organization of things is being delegated, the organization of the plenary sessions to the parliament the organization of the um, interactive um, um, digital platform to the commission, uh, the hosting of executive board meetings and so on to the council, because that's probably about all the council secretariat has the capacity to do. Um, uh, so th this secretariat isn't doing the organizing, it's really, I'd say almost a political secretariat doing the preparations of executive board meetings because they're, they're rather busy and so on. But the executive board is formally the, the linchpin of the whole thing because the, the final conclusions of the conference have to be agreed by that executive board with the risk, as I said, of, of um, minimalist ambitions, perhaps on the part of some within it. So there are, there are risks, but um, it is certainly an opportunity, and if it gains momentum, um, it, you never know where it might lead. Uh, we've been here before in the European Union, ahead of every major ref reform process in the EU. There's been a period of reflection, or of, of dialogue, always organised the same way, but that have built up a momentum for change. The... Um, the joint declaration of the three institutions that set up the conference identified a number of themes, but they are not exclusive. They're perhaps obvious ones, climate change and environmental policy, health policy post-pandemic, um, 
the economy and social justice, uh, rights and the rule of law, um, migration, Europe in the world, the digital challenge, and democracy in the EU. Now, these are not supposed to be exclusive. Anything can emerge, but the initial uh, organization of the digital platform will be around those themes and the initial citizens panels will be around those themes. Um, now, there is obviously a bit of potential tension between people who want to focus on policy, saying, yeah, we need to strengthen this policy or that policy, and those who are focused on institutional change or changing changes to the way the EU functions. I think what's likely to happen is that links will be made between the two. You can very well say that the EU could do um, a lot more on environment and climate change if there, were, if there weren't a need for unanimity in the Council on certain aspects of environmental policy, including the fiscal aspects of environmental policy, and make a link. You could say that um, on health policy, it's perhaps more a question of strengthening the executive capacity of the union. The union is a great legislative machine making rules, but when it comes to taking action, um, procurement, distribution, organizing those sort of things, it perhaps lacks what it needs. So the, the, the commission or the, the EMA perhaps lack what they need. But when it comes to uh, protecting rights and the rule of law in certain countries, the fact that we're numbered with a procedure that needs, at the end of the day, unity to take action against a member state that's failing to respect fundamental rights or the rule of law, um, sort of means you, you, the bottom line is that it's very difficult to take strong action. So there are links between policy objectives and institutional questions. And I'm sure as the conference progresses, those two will, will to a degree come together. And then of course, if you are strengthening the capacity of the union to act in certain fields, if you're addressing its competences, its powers, its procedures, you inevitably come to the question of democratic accountability. Now, much has happened over the last uh, 20 years in terms of democratic accountability. The EU is a very different animal from what it was 20 years ago in that respect. But there will also, there's still room for looking at that further. Um, what works, what doesn't work, the question of transparency, the <clears throat> question of uh, the fact that the European Parliament, uh, which now co-decides almost all legislation, but there are still some areas it does not have co-decision powers on. There's the question of how you choose the commission and its presidents, the Spitzenkandidat issue. Those, I think, will not be subjects that are necessarily up front at the start of this process, but are likely to to uh, come into it as, as it progresses. Now, what might a, a, a British contribution say? Um, the digital platform is not geo-blocked. So contributions from outside the European Union will be possible. In fact, there may even be specific provision for that in the rules of procedure, which are currently being drafted. Uh, but even if it's not explicit, it certainly is going to be possible in practice. And of course, a, a British contribution is, is welcome to address all these issues, but uh, it may well want to, in post-Brexit Britain, uh, focus on, on points like uh, our experience in Britain um, in the referendum and after it in making the case for Europe, where in public opinion did we have problems in terms of perceptions of the EU and can the EU do something about it to improve how it is seen by citizens might be one theme for a British uh, organization to pursue. Um, another theme might be the EU's neighborhood policy relations with the countries most closely associated with it. Um, should there be uh, should there be points to raise there in terms of a closer relationship or a more flexible one or, or whatever? You might even want to offer some reflections on Article 50 and how it works and uh, how it might be improved. Not that I'm hoping that Article 50 will ever be used again, but, um, but you never know. So there's an, it's perfectly reasonable for British citizens or, and residents um, in Britain or 
else living outside Britain to contribute either on such specific themes or generally to the conference. Um, there's no, there are no limitations in that respect. The only limitations is that the, the platform will of course be monitored for abusive language, uh, for trolling, if there are suddenly, uh, I don't know, 100,000 Russian contributions in one day, you know, that, that will be looked at. Um, obviously, but um, otherwise, it's uh, it's it's open, and anybody can, um, can contribute as long as you respect a charter of the conference, which is basically a cross reference to the values of the union and respectful debate and, and so on. So, um, so feel free, join in. So, a clear invitation to take part. There are quite a few questions coming up. Um, I'd just like to kick up kick off with one about the um, engagement. Are there ways of changing things, um, enhancing the engagement, um, and but with, without treaty change? Do you think that it could lead to some things without some changes without treaty changes? On that specific point about setting up systems for on a permanent basis for wider consultation with citizens, um, you, you wouldn't need a treaty change. You can you can do it like like the conference is being done without it. Being written into the treaty, and, and presumably you could set up permanent mechanisms through decisions, or even legislation, uh, for that. But on treaty change more widely, uh, yeah, we're in a situation where treaty changes need unanimity and national ratification. And we have some governments that are not exactly um, ones you would want to have uh, on on your side for most changes you might want to envisage. Treaty change doesn't always need a referendum. It dep depends on national constitutions. Um, but certainly, into, if you are addressing the capacity of the EU to deliver on what people want in certain fields, you are bound to at some point come up with what, what is stopping it. Where is the EU failing at the moment? And where it fails the most often, uh, those subjects which member states say, yeah, we should deal with this jointly at European level, but then give a right of veto because it needs unanimity. So you're forced to the level of the lowest common denominator at, at best. And uh, we, we see, you see that time and time again, many major decisions facing the European Union. That's the biggest single thing that prevents the European Union from delivering. The argument that if you think something should be done at European level, then give it the capacity to do so. If you don't, then keep it at the national level. Fine, principle of subsidiarity. But if you confer a responsibility on the European Union, you've got to confer the means to deal with it, and not give 27 members of the council each a right of veto. Um, 